ghosts. Ghouls. Goblins. Unspeakable horrors. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hello! Oh, I'm very blurry, aren't I? Scary Halloween! Scary, it's scary, it's scary Halloween! It's scary. We all... We all scared? We all feeling scared? Ooh! Ooh! Candle. Halloween, everyone. Oh! Scared the camera. That's exactly it. I've given it a 70s horror... 70s horror feel and... Uh, smeared. Smeared. The camera in Vaseline. Three, rid ourselves of that. Let's rid ourselves of that. And let's shed a little light on the situation, shall we? Well, do you know what, Jim? <laughs> Different ink! <laughs> this is fantastic. Detail Thank you so much! Absolutely brilliant. For 100 delicious bits. <laughs> a hype train is, is, is it's pulling brilliant. into the station, it's everyone. Really, really good. A hype train is pulling into the station. Get hyped! Oh, it's gonna get warm already. I'm already getting warm. My shirt, my collar's an absolute shambles. This tie is terrible. Don't don't spend three pounds on an Amazon tie, everyone. That's what I'm saying. Here we are. I hope you're. I hope you're not having a nice. <laughs> Pull up a scare. <laughs> uh, that's all I've got of those, to be honest. That's all I've got of those. I've gone too far. I'm sorry, everyone. I apologize. I apologize profusely. Here I am, rocking like a hurricane. Have we all had a lovely Halloween? Because I'm about, I have to apologise. Uh, let me get my water. Um, I'm about to ruin it. I'm about to ruin it because you're about to experience chills. Am I in a room with the moon? Like you've never experienced before. I have here a book. I definitely didn't just Google short horror stories. Didn't just get this. And you're definitely not about to hear a story. Well, you are. Jim Binthar, welcome on in. I hope you're having a nice. Is it a spooky tome? The writer is called Claude Vestibule. Claude Vestibule, everyone. Claude Vestibule. It's quite a lengthy story. So what I'm going to say is, settle in. Get settled in. Hello, Cudder. I hope you're having a nice... Claude Vestibule. 
striking fear. Love a good story. So yeah, it's long. So what I'm going to say is, settle in, everyone. Settle in. Now, there may be after Thursday's streams. Oh, I thought it got changed to just chatting. Welcome on in, at the Beast. Welcome on in. It's not letting me change it to just chatting for some reason. It's not coming up with anything. Maybe it's just Rust is not, uh, not Rust. OBS is not liking the eye of me just chatting. There we go. There we go. Hopefully that should work. Uh, just a word. So after Thursday's stream, these streams from the fantastic Pip, the fantastic Barmer, the fantastic Pickleby, and the fantastic uh, Ant the Beast, who's in chat. Shout out Ant the, Beast, Ant the Beast, please. Phenomenal stuff they did on Thursday and on Saturday, which I was very honored to play a tiny little part in. You may be worrying, and all I want to say is be calm. There is no, there will be no images, no like graphic images in this at all. No graphic images, no pictures of anything grim or violence. There's going to be, I'm not bashing my head into a keyboard. None of that kind of stuff. But what I will say is there are descriptions. There are descriptions in this story of some, you know, some pretty, pretty gruesome stuff. But it's all it's going to be is just a lovely little book reading. Claude Vestibule. Description of the bum bums as well. Now, as I'm reading, I'm not going to be able to pay much that, that much attention to chat. And I'm sorry about that. But my focus will be on the book. So behave yourselves, everyone. I'll try and, you know, I'm going to try and dip in. <laughs> I'm going to try and dip in. But um, I'm also worried it's too dark. But we'll see how we get on. Uh, so the, the story comprises of 10 parts, 10 chapters. Um, maybe, Sparkle, can we get a, a pinned, a pinned, um, pinned message just saying that there will be some descriptions of violence in this book? There'll be some description of descriptions of violence. Oh, and we've also got that. This might be a hefty pinned message. Um, so yeah, I won't be able to interrupt, but I'm trusting you all to be behave yourselves, basically. Behave yourselves. Now, if anyone is feeling a bit like, oh, I don't know about this, I'm feeling a little bit uh, uncomfortable. What I would say is in about 20 minutes, Big Taff Man will be doing a lovely, wholesome, nice time stream for those who aren't feeling the, the Halloween spirit today. Thank you so much, everyone, for that level two hype train or level one, whatever it is. I always get confused. Description advice in the story. Perfect. Um, so what I say is take this opportunity, get a drink. I thought I saw an orb then, and that's not a bit. <laughs> that's not a bit. I genuinely thought I just saw a little orb go by. And now I just thought, of, oh, if only I could have made that happen. That would have been perfect. Just want to make it, make it clear. Make it clear. Just want to make it clear. I don't believe in ghosts. So me seeing an orb doesn't mean anything to me. But it's just the fact we're doing a Halloween stream and I think I just saw a little... Which is clearly just a thing of dust, right? It's just a thing of dust. Ghosts aren't real, says Barmer. Rest in peace. Barmer, everyone. Can we all get a rest in peace for Barmer, please? Tragically taken from us on Thursday. But luckily there, is lot, there are lots of Barmer variants out there to fill our voids. Um, Jimmy McBarmer. Now there's three of them, apparently. Uh, we've got the rubs. We've got the tenpenny. So, you know, we've lost Barmer in one dimension, but we've got Dimar but Barmer in many others. Uh, it's a little bit dark, so I'll do my best to read. And I'm not the best at uh, sort of just reading aloud. So please do bear that in mind. 
Bear in mind, I'm dyspraxic as well, so my tongue gets a bit mixed up sometimes when I'm trying to talk. So this isn't going to be the smoothest of book readings, but by golly, we're going to do our best. Fluffy Pink, fluffy pink Blonde, welcome, welcome on in. And then after this, we'll be going to see Precious Rogue as they play Resident Evil 7 in about 45 minutes, so they won't hear the end of this story. More fool them. More fool them. Known void filler. Uh, there's one other thing I just need to get ready. And that is some atmospheric sounds. Oh no, this is actual songs. Don't want that. Autumn Village. Hey. The, the biggest terror is consumerism, everyone. Uh, you can actually hear that because it's muted, but that was a solid, solid... Solid joke for me there in terms to the YouTube advert that just came on. Okay. Is everyone ready? Everyone make themselves uncomfortable? Scary story time. Peter Quince. One. One. Peter Quince had just been stabbed for the 26th consecutive time and it bloody hurt. Bloody being the right term, as I watched his person petrol spurt onto, and quite frankly, ruining the once cream of wheat rug, now a more cream of peat rug. Peter's eyes were locked directly onto mine, as he sent non-verbal messages of what he was feeling and experiences, and those messages were crystal clear, two, col two coloured blue ticks for sure. These voiceless communications and a few context clues all said loudly, we might be in trouble here. As soon as I finished making this observation, Peter's chest popped like a champagne bottle, red bubbles frothed, and a shimmering silver shape came emerging from it, like Thunderbird 1 launching from a shaken can of cherry tango. The shape glimmered with evil, malice, and what was probably bits of lung and bones. I have to say, Peter looked like dog shit. The shape began to raise, careening through Peter's body, slicing him like a delicious deli meat, up and up past his thorax, thorax, into his neck, through his chin, through his mouth, essentially giving him four lips, which is at best well above average. I was locked, frozen as fear, frozen in fear, as Peter was being split in half from a quarter way up of his body like a cheese string. The shape gliding through the wrapping paper that was Pete, once Peter Qu uh, Quince's brains finally reached its destination, popping out of the top of his skull, sending his toupee falling to the ground. It was at this point I realised that Peter probably wasn't going to make it. I began to run as fast as my shapely, well-crafted legs could take me, probably beating my PB pace. If I think about it, perhaps I should arrange for a life-threatening circumstance next time I do a 10k. I dared not look behind me, for fear of what I might see. If this was going to be the end, I didn't want to see it coming. If this was the end, you may well be asking, what was the beginning? We made it through chapter one. Short, short intro, short intro. Are we all feeling okay? Well, an end to the chapter. It's more of a prologue, but we're going to be jumping back in time, so it's like a post-log at the beginning. I don't know. Two. It's a crisp autumn morning in Stretton-on-Dunsmore, a nothing town in the middle of nothing country. Sure, we had the dizzying heights of Wrighton on Dunsmore nearby, but for a nothing person like me, there was a nothing chance of me being able to make something especially something enough for me to be able to live like the highly life they do in the R.O.D. That's uh, that's your writing on Dunsman, Dunsmore. 
The leaves cracked under my feet like a ham- like- um, sorry. The leaves cracked under my feet like hamster skeletons as I was making my way to Knob Hill Community Centre. I made this journey every Tuesday and I stuck to the same routine. I waved to Mrs. Haddock Shrimp in the post office window, hid from the youths on the village green to avoid them throwing fidget spinners and mobile phones at me again, which was becoming far too frequent for my liking. I'd pass Peter Quince, looking forlornly at a at country-style hair salon. I'd then begin my climb of Knob Hill. The ascent of the old gnarled surface of Knob Hill was a tough one. It would cause a lot of heavy breathing, but I knew after some perseverance I'd reach its climax. Every Tuesday, it's book club. And little did I know that this week's session would be our last. As previously established, before you mark it as a contrivance, it was autumn, and more specifically, the end of October. And to be even more specific, it was a week before, and you won't bloody believe this, Halloween. I pushed at the large, dull grey doors hard, but that's strange. That was it was strange, unusual. They wouldn't budge. I applied more force. Nothing. I slammed my absolutely fucking hent shoulder into this cunt of a door, but no avail. Was some sort of force trying to warn me? Trying to save me from the fate of what lied ahead for me and the Knob Hill bookheads? It then occurred to me this, this was in fact a pull door. I made my way into the center sheepishly, hoping no one had noticed the incredibly loud sounds of my body smashing into the door or me calling the door a hinged bastard. And by calling, I meant screaming it at the top of my lungs. As usual, five seats were laid out in a circle, but something was different this time. A giant star had been drawn on the floor in duct tape, while mostly Simone must have run out of run out before she had finished and finished the job with masking tape and coloured it in with a with a sharpie. Pretty creepy, huh? Simone grinned, her Groucho glasses, nose slash and moustache slipping off her face. As she scrambled to readjust her face, her grin turned into a grimace. She was eyeing me from head to toe, drinking in my acerbly, absurdly old Fat Willie's t-shirt and little denim shorts. Didn't dress up, huh? She looked over at Robert Cloche and Leskin Trapped Gal, equally as unfancy dressified as me. Simone ate a biscuit more furiously than I've ever seen anyone eat a biscuit before. Little did she know this would be the last rage biscuit she'd ever have. I took my seat next to Lessie as always. That's uh, Leskin Trapped Gal's nickname. This was more out of habit than anything. I like them, don't get me wrong. They had several Homer Simpson t-shirts, so you knew they were an absolute laugh. But just like all the members of Bookheads, I had no desire to get to know them on a more personal level, outside of our little literary bubble. They too were all residents of Stretton on Dunsmore, so were nothing people. Peter Quince finally entered after his weekly salon vigil. As I watched Peter take his chair, I caught the tail end of Robert's conversation with Simone. Robert would often drone on and on about stuff I didn't understand and had no desire to. So, yeah, uh, anyway, Closh farted his, out of his talk hole. Scream set up the trope of being a metatextual horror tale, but this became so commonplace that it's been become such a tired narrative device and parody of itself. I pity anyone who has to endure such a thing. He then turned, looking out of the page, and winked at you. Little did he know, this would be the last piece of fourth wall breaking ironic commentary he would ever make. We spend the first six hours discussing last week's book, The Squid's Physician, by Lucille Cleft. A parable detailing the character's journey learning some lessons with an ill squid which they need to take on a road trip. It was ever so quirky. We were approaching the moment I had been dreading. As it was Halloween the following week, we had all been tasked with finding a horror book to read. And each of us would present the book on that most spooky of nights. This night, though, we had to tell each other what books we had found, and I had made minimal effort, which is why before making my journey to the book club, I had stopped into that new mysterious bookshop that had recently opened. So are we having a good time? 
Um, are we all feeling okay? We move into chapter three. No chapter titles, just says three. <gasps> Sorry, I need a bit of drink. Uh, three. We're flying through it, to be fair. I was worried this was going to go on too long, but we're doing quite well. When I first approached the shop, I tried to peer through the window, but all I could see was dust and cobwebs. How strange, I thought to myself. I thought... <clears throat> I thought this shop was new, yet the window is so dusty and cobwebby. I took a step back from this new shop with oddly dusty and cobweb windows. I said to myself, out loud this time, truly bizarre for a new, I really put the emphasis on new, new shop to have windows covered in so much dust and cobwebs. I then shrugged and headed inside. As the door opened, a chime playing the Chukaracha played. I realised an advert just played then, didn't it? This book is sponsored by Hilton Hotels, apparently. Apologies. As the door opened, a chime played La Chucaracha. The room, as far as I could tell, as little light could shine through the windows, as a result of how covered in dust and cobwebs they were, was littered with piles of books. The old smell the old shop smelled. The old shop smelled. The old shop smelled of books, sounded like books, tasted like books, and touched like books. As I scanned the room, I spotted a shadowy finger behind a counter, who I struggled to make out at first, probably because the dust and cobwebs in the window. I heard so <clears throat> I heard some shuffling and then some rattling, which sounded like a like a box of matches. Suddenly, a tiny flame burst out at the end of a tiny stick, confirming my suspicions that it was indeed a matchbox. The figure moved the little ickle baby fire towards a candle-shaped object on the counter. But as it moved, this was followed by muttering of words of like bollocks, fuck, and cunt musket. And after some more shuffling... Oh, hang on. I've missed a line out there. As it was moved, as it was moved, the flame disappeared. This was followed by muttering and words like bollocks, fuck, and cunt musket. After some more shuffling and matchbox-like noise, another flame burst into life. This one made its way to the candle-shaped object. This time, there was an ah sound as the match dropped to the floor and the figure appeared to be waving their hand about a little. Seven match attempts later, a warm glow began to radiate the surroundings of the candle-like shape. Revealing that it was in fact a candle. My instincts were on top form that day. Or at the time, I thought. I'm sure if I were to ask Peter Quince about it now, he'd have a more split opinion on the matter. Because he's, you know, been split it off. As my eyes adjusted to the flickering light caused by the heat, by the heat beam bobbing atop the long white candle, I began to make out the appearance of the woman at the counter. An eruption of grey hair, like what you'd get from a really boring volcano, spurted from her head, and much like Pulp Fiction, it had no order to it. Her flesh was like a terrain map, with wrinkles you could hide your Christmas presents in and no one would ever find them. She gave me a toothy grin, or in this case, a not-so-toothy grin, as she was missing those square ones in between your ca canines on the bo both the top and the bottom at the front of your mouth. Every now and then, her gnarled tongue would squelch its way through this stained gateway and it reminded me of when Greg Wallace goes to a factory and you see a sausage or something like that get made. She wore a fleece with horses on it. Ah, my first customer, she croned. Initially, I thought she winked at me, but it was just that one eye was permanently closed. Her tongue darted in and out like a cuckoo from a clock. 
I've been hoping someone would gaze through my dusty and cobweb windows. It's felt so empty inside. She made direct eye co one eye contact with me. What is it you seek? I tried my hardest, hardest to make it obvious that I couldn't stop looking at the pimply slug that was her tongue. Uh, yeah, well, I just I just need a small scary book for my for my book club. Uh, I honestly don't care what it is, uh, and I'm in a bit of a rush. A slow and steady string of saliva did a failed bungee jump attempt off the end of the woman's tongue and splattered on the countertop. Ah, something to incite fear. Make your blood run cold, eh? Our horror section is just over there. She raised a bonely, strangely grey finger, pointing to one of the random pile of books. A long fingernail that was so curled that it looked like it should be followed by gmail.com protruded from its end. We have a wide selection, including the Boost Cup, Goosebumps book, Say Cheese and You Die. Did you know Ryan Gosling was in the television episode of that one? She croned. All right, IMDb trivia, I responded as I headed to the nondescript pile. I, horrible phrase here, fingered the blurb of the top book. Some sort of story about a witch who had the legs of a horse. I quickly rejected it and moved it aside. Are you sure? That one gets pretty steamy. She winked. Or in her case, blinked. Because when she, when she winked, they were both closed. I was desperate to get out. I was in a rush. A, I was in a rush. And B, that lady made my guts feel like they were turning inside out. So I just picked the very next book and hurried over to the counter. Oh no. I'm not sure you want that one. <laughs> she cackled. I glanced down at the book. Its hardcover emblazoned with golden crisscross patterns felt heavy in my hands. There was no blurb or distinct description of the book's content. Just the words, be love, be dream. which didn't exactly send chills up my spine, or arms, or anus. Yeah, I want it. Ring it up, please. I'm running late. I handed over a book of stamps. They are legal tender. And she returned a flesh-dewned hand with a Scottish banknote in it. I shoved the book in my satchel. Shut up, I'm a big person. Making no further assessment of it, and hurried towards the door, next to the windows, covered in dust and cobwebs. The woman called after me, please do come again. <laughs> Lol. I shot out of the door and as I hurried out of the shop, I took one look back through the window, but I couldn't see the crone on account of all the dust and cobwebs. I started the journey I told you about earlier. This is the past, remember? Well, this is all in the past, but this was at the beginning of the past. I'm telling you about. Be love, be dream, everyone. Be love. Be dream. We're on to chapter four. We're flying through it. We're flying through it. Four. The five of us sat, each at, <clears throat> each at points of Simone's makeshift tape pentagram. Time to relax. I'm getting fed up of these adverts. <laughs> Did you see that orb? Did you see that orb float down there? Did you see it go down there? Fuck. The five of us sat, 
at each uh, each oh, I'm getting all muddled up now. Each at points of Simone's makeshift tape pentagram. I was sweating my hole off, realizing I knew nothing about my book. Simone began, well, I guess you all know about my book from my costume, huh? Fantastic. Yeah. Dad, dad, thank you very much. It's really, really good. Put the rat in literature. Is that a good thing? But that's a good thing. Light just went out in the landing. Well, I guess you all know my book from my costume. Huh. We're on chapter four, Ed. Something my mind does when I'm in these stressful situations is I begin thinking visually. And as someone described, as Simone described her book, I began, uh, I began picturing it as a film trailer. Sounds scary, huh? Finished Simone. My gooch tightened as I knew it was I was going to have to do some bullshitting very shortly. But for now, it was Lessie's turn. They cleared their throat, so I've selected So I've selected The Laundering by horror legend Bumpton Vance. After a crazed killer, it dies in a freak washing machine accident. Will you survive the laundering? It was now my turn. I pulled my book out of my satchel. Shut up, yeah, it's just a satchel, Christ. When I began to speak, my voice started a little higher than usual. Ah, yes, well, uh, my book is sweat filled every orifice. It, it, it's a tale of, uh... Everyone was looking at me like I was a right knobhead. It's a allegory on the horrors of global, global mou mouse, mouse testing, the mouse uprising. 
I was fiddling with the book in my hands furiously, so much so I gave myself a paper cut, and one tiny but perfect sphere of blood, like a mouse's testicle, very much had mice on the mind, dripped from the book's edge and landed onto one of the masking tape sections of Simone's demonic floor geometry. On the moment of impact, all of my hair stood on end, including my pubes, and a shiver coursed throughout my body, including my pubes. There was a moment's silence, not because of a national tragedy occurred. I wondered if everyone else had experienced that same sensation. I was about to ask, but then, of course, Robert Klosh began to speak. Uh, are you going to finish that? Clush was eyeing up Peter Quince's Jammy Dodger, not a euphemism, which Peter had half raised to his face before this potentially gr potential group physical sensation took place. Peter, as if snout snapped out of a trance, hurried the entire Jammy Dodger into his mouth and swallowed it whole without even chewing, then proceeded to tell us about his book. Oh, so it's a little off the top, please, and if you could just randomly set fire to my ears... That would be great. There were now two colossal elephants in the room. What exactly had we all just felt? Had we even all felt it? And what exactly is it with quince and hair? I once again made a mental preparation to ask everyone if they too had their spine feel like it had been... <clears throat> Sorry. I once again made pre mental preparations to ask everyone if they too had their spine feel like it had just bitten straight into a calippo. I didn't feel like I didn't like to put myself out there much. And somewhere when I what, sometimes when I want to speak, it feels like a thousand hands inside my stomach playing parachute games with its lining. I inhale deeply, trying to calm. Then the hyped up children dancing around my tummy. Sorry, trying to calm the hyped up children around my tummy. And just as I was about to spur out the first syllable from my toothy food slot, Closh, of course, beat me to the punch. Well, have I got a book for all you nerds? We were all, of course, used to this now. Robert Closh liked to think he was edgy. One of those people who feel the need to tell you they have a dark sense of humor every three minutes. Then say the same dead baby joke you've heard thousands of times. Likes to tell you that anything popular isn't good, despite they never going out of their way to try it. Had a Banksy print on their wall. You know, that general sort of person. Mating the panther, Klosh announced, surveying the room to see if it got the reaction it desired, which as usual, it didn't. It's an erotic novel. A zookeeper falls for this guy, but the guy gets, th get this right, the guy can turn into a panther. She starts getting the horn for him before she's even seen him in human form. I think she fucks the panther, guys. He began to read the blurb. And before that trailer could start playing in my head, I had to stop myself mentally. I had to block out Robert's voice for a, mo a moment, but it began to trickle back in. Better than all the ironic self-parodying bullshit you're all reading, I'm sure. He said scratching at his crotch. Little did he know it was the last crotch he'd ever have. We all made our usual pleasantries before heading in our different directions, 
into the night. We're at chapter five. Well, actually, sorry, we're at V. This one's V. They haven't all been, haven't all been done like that, but you know. Um, how's everyone doing? Are we all feeling okay? Are we all? No one freaked out yet. No one's uh, worried. Look after that voice. I know it's dif it's difficult. It's um. We're all we're all having a great time. Yeah, we're all we're all feeling good. You're full of mistrust and foreboding. I. I don't know why that would be the case. V. There was a chill in the air, much like the one which had recently climbed up my backbone pole. Eerily similar, in fact, and the dark was engulfing. Luckily, there were street lamps which, famously, make it easier to see. I was making my way home in a more hurried pace than usual, but a strange noise stopped me in my tracks. It was hard to describe, like a guttural mumbling and the cackle of a crow simultaneously, followed by what resembled sludge being forced through a polo mint. I took a moment to look around. There was no sign of anyone or... anything? You saw another orb! Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit... I'm starting to get a little bit antsy. With all these orbs floating about. Where's my drink? I thought I put it down here. I thought I put... Sorry, I must have misremembered. Must have misremembered. Uh, right, where were we? Spooky! There was no sign of anyone or anything is where we were. I began to move again, but was once again stopped in my tracks. That noise again. My blood pe pressure was seeing better days. My lungs fucked. Sweat began to drip from all my angles. I wanted to speak out, but there was a bouncy castle in my belly and no one had taken their shoes off. I spotted something on the ground, shimmering in the moonlight. A slim trail, which must have been left by a slug or a snail or your mum. But none of these were to be seen. Then the streetlights began to flicker. Sorry, I was ill-prepared with my cue for that. Ill-prepared with my cue. This is this is high this is high quality stuff you get in here. But the streetlight began to flicker. Oh, hang on. There we go. <laughs> Streetlight began to flicker. It's very subtle flickering I'm getting. This is very subtle flickering we're getting. But you get the idea. You get the idea. All, all the incredible theatrics you've got here going on. Uh... Then the streetlights began to flicker, switching me into two different worlds in quick succession. One of complete darkness, one of disorientating light, until the world of darkness remained, and the sound of a long electrical hum were all the lamps were giving me, which was quite, frankly, rude. And something else I heard in the street choir of hums were footsteps, and they seemed to be getting louder. I looked around, but I couldn't see shit. My heart was pounding, 
Badum, badum, badum. Just as Lethal Biddle described in his song Police on My Back. Whatever happened to him? Did he get cancelled? That dickhead song about Jeremy Clarkson was pretty good. I refocused. My flight reflex had kicked in and I began to run. I knew a shortcut I could take through the green. Hopefully those youths wouldn't be there to do Fortnite dances at me. My muscles were fit to burst, as were all my organs. I was in luck. The green was empty. My next obstacle was a hedge. My plan was to go over it. I instead went through it. Thorns scratched, twigs prodded, leaves tickled, but I made it through. My door was in sight, the safety of home. My quivering hands made several futile attempts at putting the key through the door. Had even struggled to remove them from my chain wallet in the first place. I had no idea of the sound of the footsteps remained. All I could hear was blood rushing in my ears. I finally opened the door, stepped in and slammed the door behind me. I put all of my weight on the door and tried to regain my senses. There was less weight to put against the door as I hoped, as I, as I had hoped, as somewhere in the panic I had lost my satchel. Yes, I have a satchel. Get over it. We're flying through it. We're on part six. Four more parts to go. Now. This is where things might start to get a little... A little gruesome. Simone, on the other hand, hadn't had seven shades of shit scared out of her. She arrived home, Groucho glasses still on, and was greeted as usual by her cat, the Right Honourable Professor Crispin Dunderfeld Esquire. Happy to see me, huh? The Right Honourable Professor Crispin Dunderfield Esquire gave Simone a look of complete apathy, as all cats do. That was until Simone put her copy of Nosferatu down onto the reasonably priced and just about does the job coffee table from Wayfair. This caused the cat to stand on his teeny tiny toe beans before darting off the landing and releasing a stress stench. Not a fan, huh? Simone carried on about her business, poured a completely full, undiluted glass of Vimto, popped on Forces TV and watched an episode of Heartbeat, followed with half an episode of London's Burning. The heat caused psychologically by the show, by the firefighters, the fire, and mostly the intense drama, caused Simone to feel the need to cool herself down. So she opened a window and suddenly the book on the table opened. Pretty windy, huh? Said Simone, but she had noticed she hadn't even felt a whisper of a breeze. She thought nothing of it, gave a shrug, and went to brush the absolutely caked layers of Vimto from her teeth. When she reached the mirror, she saw they were still wearing the Groucho glasses, and she laughed for a solid 15 minutes. Pretty funny, huh? She said to herself, but then something broke the jovial atmosphere. From the bathtub, she heard a scratching noise. She edged towards the tub, knowing she had the house to herself that night. Also, in the distance, she could hear something that sounded mysterious like pages turning. She slowly put out one hand and gently grasped the hilarious Greg shower curtain that Lessie had gifted them for Secret Santa in Christmas 2017. Like I said earlier, Lessie is a proper, proper laugh. Simone tightened her grip and yanked the curtain open. The Right Honourable Professor Crispin Dunderfield Esquire leapt out of the bath. Simone absolutely shat it. Her pupils were as big as a one year old coin. A wave of relief washed over her, albeit briefly, because then she felt it. A light tickle on her face, darting from place to place, journeying from eyebrow to cheek, nose to chin. Someone tried to, Simone tried to grab at it, 
but not to no avail. Each time it would scurry away. Simone felt wretched. Whatever this was, it was hairy, and she could feel the ends of the, the ends lightly brushing her flesh. She moved to the mirror and couldn't believe her eyes. The moustache from her Groucho glasses had disconnected from the nose and was now writhing about her very being. She was frozen for a while, horrified by the crawling tash and that horrible, light-touching sensation. She then tried to pounce and surprise the nose fluff, but it was to no use. It was too fast. She tried again and again, each attempt becoming more desperate. It be she began scratching, clawing at her own face, beginning to draw blood. Her face burned with pain and now only felt able to let out a scream or at least attempt to. As the lip broom had other ideas, it crawled into her mouth, undoubtedly picking up some flecks of Vimto on its way. Simone wanted to vomit. Panic had consumed her, or in this case, she had consumed the panic. She could feel it wriggling around her, her speech meat and yum yum chompers. It then travelled into her throat, blocking her airwaves. Choking her, Simone thought to herself. Little did she know, this would be the last her she ever had. There we go, there I am. She reached into her own mouth to attempt to fish out the new, now undoubtedly soggy lump of hair while simultaneously slamming her back against the wall in hopes of dislodging it. But then there was a new sensation for all this. The glasses and nose remained on her face, and she suddenly felt the nose begin to compress, closing her own nostrils. The only holes she had left weren't breathing holes. She struggled and struggled and struggled until she could struggle no more. Literally out of breath, she crumbled to the ground, the last bit of life escaping her, just not through her nose or mouth. The professor walked in and looked at Simone's scratched, slightly comical face, she had still the glass, had the glasses on, and began to set about planning how he would eat her, because all cats will do that. Now, of course, narratively, I had no idea that this had happened this way at the time. What I saw was the article the following morning, saying she had choked on a hilarious novelty item. I sat in complete shock. This had not been an ideal 24 hours. We move on to part seven, everyone. And this, will you just focus on me? Come on, come on now. It's seven, but instead of a V, it's got the, it's got the numbers, number seven, like the film. Though it's, it's nothing like the film. One person who had yet to see the news that morning was Lessie. Lessie had had a lion, and on the sixth time they attempted to hit the snooze button, they caused absolute havoc on the nightstand. And I've written, that's been written as havoc on the nightstand. Knocking off their clock, lava lamp, and their copy of The Laundering. Which landed open, face up, on the floor. As it is well documented, Lessie is a goddamn laugh. Their slippers, shaped like monster feet, are testament to that. They slipped those bad, bad boys on and began get setting about their day. Toast, buttered both sides, tea, sugar in first, then milk, then water, then tea bag. Shoo the foxes out of their pantry, four sneezes, apply the lotion, check if Bebo is back, air out the potatoes. Little did they know, these would be the last potatoes they would ever air out. One of the last items on the agenda was to select which fun tie to put on. Lessie weighed up the two possible options, one in each hand. Was it to be the one which said, if found, please return to pub, return to, return to pub, classic Lessie, or the one that Stewie, with Stewie Griffin on? They assessed each of the options. 
Behind them, they didn't notice that a drawer seemed to open of its own volition. Lessie took a step forward. They didn't want to, but they did. And then another. And another. And gradually picked up pace. Faster and faster. Lessie involuntarily running now. No control over their own feet. The monster slippers were the captain now. And they sent Lessie running full force. Running into a wall. Leaving behind a mural of snoz juice. Splattered on the wall. Lessie's nose was busted. And this misshapen blood... Uh, busted and misshapen. Blood poured down their chin. This all happened so quickly that Lessie hadn't even had a chance to process what had happened and was dazed from the impact. But before they had a chance to regather themselves, the slippers were on the move again. The lights turned back on. The slippers, uh, yeah, the slippers are on the move again. Did I get to that? The slippers ran Lessie, tie still in their hands, toward the railing above the stairs. Lessie collided with the banister, tum-tum first, and the force in which they hit it sent them hurtling over the top. Lessie braced for a landing, but it never came. The ties around her, their hands had fastened around the railing and left Lessie dangling, arms raised, feet dangling, finally released from the slippers as they slid off, her, off their feet and went tumbling to the ground. Back in Lessie's room at the freshly, drawer, at the freshly opened drawer slivered out a belt. Its leather body gliding off the charming parquet floor. It twisted itself up the vertical bit of the railing banister thing, along the its top, stopping at Lessie's helpless bound hands, straining at the weight of the rest of their own body. The belt spiralled down one of the tensed arms, past Lessie's Elmer Fudd smoking a massive blunt tattoo. Legend! Past this... past the tear and blood-stained mug down to their waist and began to fasten itself. Leslie's words were becoming garbled and unintelligible with the fear and agony of the unfolding situation, but I imagine it was something along the lines of, this won't do. The belt began to tighten and tighten and tighten and Leslie roared in pain so much you couldn't hear their hips being turned into mush and bone porridge. The belt continued to do its squishing business, cutting into Leslie's skin. Something had to give and unfortunately it was looking like it was going to have to be Leslie's lower half which rocketed off like when you cover a watermelon in elastic bands. Lessie was now like an awful piñata, with their guts and kidneys and stuff providing the gruesome sweeties. Also, their legs broke when they fell, hit the floor, which probably must have hurt as well. I was still reeling from the news about Simone, so I put the radio on to try and calm my nerves. Just after Sledgehammer Peter Ga by Peter Gabriel had faded to its perfect conclusion, the news came on, and it was about Lessie. It detailed the horrid state in which they had been discovered, which seemed odd for daytime local radio. The news piece finished with a soundbite from police detective Cliff Gingersnap. We don't believe the two deaths are connected. Probably freak accidents. As the two deceased are a woman and a BAME non-binary person, we will be making minimal investigation into the matter. If there is another death, and that of a white man, we'll be escalate our efforts. I couldn't believe my ears. The lights, the chase, Simone, and now Lessie. The world 
just lost a first-class laugh. There is no way these things aren't connected, I thought. I took a seat and adopted a contemplative pose. So you know I meant business, and I began to try and put all these pieces together then. Bang, 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 bang! A furious knocking at my door. I froze. I didn't know what to do. Open, please! I recognised that voice. I sprang to my feet, opened the door, and there stood Peter Quince, his hands full of hair. We're at chapter eight, but I need, I need the toilet, gang. I'm in need of the toilet. Uh, hang on. Let me get my... Uh, where is it? I made a thing to get this up. There we go. That's good. Right. Uh, yeah, just take this moment to calm down. We're, there's a lot of horror. We've, we've experienced a lot of horror there. Uh, so yeah, if you could, uh, just, you know, bear with me. Coming back. It's me! It's me! Uh, where did I put the book? Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, oh. oh, how are we all doing? Are we all okay? We're at part eight. We're, we're flying through it. Like I said, we're doing much better than I thought. I thought it was good to maybe take it out like an hour and a half, but... I reckon it will be about the hour that I was aiming for, which is nice, but it won't focus on me, will it? Come on. Give me something, camera. Uh, here I am. There we go. Eight. It's A-T-E. Peter Quince was trembling. I'm real. I'm real. Let's focus on something none of us can see. Something like that. 
Don't like that. We've had a couple of orbs. Where were we? Peter Quince was trembling, his hands full of head grass. He's real, he kept saying. He's real! I tried to remain calm. Uh, who's real, Peter? Talk to me! Whose hair is that? It's... It's mine! He removed his fat face beanie. I made a mental note of it as I thought I might pop in and grab one if, it, if I had the chance. Only during the sale, though. It, it was fat face, after all, and I'm not some sort of money hen laying money eggs of cash about the place. Peter Quince's once lush, soft, lovely smelling hair was all gone. It used to flow down his to his mid-back like a blonde waterfall, a golden shower, if you will. He took it all. Plus, I, I've got a pair of scissors in my left shoulder. He turned, and there, protruding from his left neck shelf, was a pay, pair of barber's scissors. I thought, I thought the book would help, weeped Peter. What, what do you mean? Well, you see, since my childhood, I've, I've, I've had a fear of barbers. That's, that's why I had such thick, glorious mane. It wasn't through choice. Blood was spurting from his shoulder like a party popper. So I thought reading a book about a psycho killer, run, run away, he added, barber would help. Like immersion therapy, you know, but he's real. The man bun, the curved mustache, the impossibly tight jeans. It's all real. And he's after me. He slumped into a seat, his deepest fears coming to life. Why, why do you fear them? I inquired. Well, as, as a kid, you could see he was struggling to talk like this, to be open. I went, I went to get my hair cut and he, he paused. He inhaled. He exhaled. They put me in one of those, a tear rolled down his cheek. One of those, you know, car seats, seats that look, look like a car, but it, but it was working. Before, before you knew it, I'd somehow reversed out of the shop and I was just a mere child. I had no idea how to drive. I had no control and I was taken on a backwards hell ride. He looked to the floor, staring hard at my new cream of wheat rug. I put a comforting hand on his shoulder. He screamed in agony. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about your scissor problem. I cringed. I got all the way to Stroud before they stopped me. Something started to clip in my, click in my brain. The blood, the pentagram, Simone, Lessie, the barber coming to life. It was obvious and definitely in no way a contrived conclusion to come to with all the information I had. Our books, our books were becoming a reality. And I, I had no idea what my book contained. I had no idea of what I had to fear. I had to fear everything. People were, weren't safe, places weren't safe. And I couldn't find out. I'd lost my satchel. Yes, I have all the blood. Yes, I have a bloody satchel. All the blood drained from my face. Meanwhile, Pinterquince was fashioning a toupee with the parts of hair he had in his hands and sellotape. He broke off a piece of tape. Little did he know this would be the last piece of tape he would ever break off. I had to find the book. I simply had to. Then Peter asked a question that sent dread into every nook and cranny of my being. What about Robert Cloche? I just so happened to have his home number, so I gave it a call. A warm, friendly voice of an older lady answered, 01446 746 Ah, yes, I was just wondering if, uh, hello, I was just hoping if, wondering if Robert was home? My Bobby? No, I'm afraid he isn't. He's gone on what he called a, a Tinder date. They've gone to the zoo. He took a book to read to her, the old romantic. Oh no, I said. Oh no, replied Peter, who was in earshot. Oh no, asked the kind sounding lady on the phone. Is something the map? The phone went dead. A heartbeat later, a large red and white spiral-patterned pole came crashing through my window. 
double glazing too, so pretty impressive. And following the pole, dove in the deadliest hipster in the tightest jeans I had ever seen. And with cat-like reflexes, he jumped at Peter Quince, and with his scissors, began to wildly stab at Peter, making him into the human version of that bit of kaplunk you put all the sticks through. Peter wrestled the barber off him, and somehow got to his, somehow got to his feet. He looked at me. I tried to think where I kept my plasters. This is where you originally joined me in this story. Part one. That was all the way part one. We're there now. We're at now part nine. N-E-I-N. We've only got two parts left. Sorry, I'm getting a bit hot. I'm going to take my tie off. <sighs> Ooh. Right. Save my collar. Come on now. Ty's keeping me alive. <laughs> As I ran from my house, I tried to get the image of Banana Split Peter out of my head. My thoughts turned to Robert Klosh, who was almost certainly being railed to death by a panther right now. I needed to know what was in my book. What was coming for me? Who was coming for me? I thought I'll see if the bookshop had another copy. Then I can make preparations, defend myself. Probably one of those things that only last till Halloween, right? I ran past the post office, gave Mrs. Haddock a shrimp a, a wave as usual, and when I arrived at the shop, I was anticipating to see those dusty and cobwebbed windows. But I saw no dust, and I saw no windows. A SWAT team passed, as well as a fleet of police cars, heading in the direction of the zoo. I caught the vague sound of, White man in trouble, code red, as they passed. Not only was there no dust or cobwebs, there was no bookshop. Just a sign saying, Nando's coming soon. Which was huge, if true. Was this nothing place becoming something? I fell to my knees, crestfallen. But as my knee hit the ground... I felt a sting. I investigated. It was a thorn. The hedge, I thought. It must be. But the time was 4pm. I must have lost my satchel in the hedge. But it's 4pm. Pride time for the youths to be there at the green. The kids' party in my stomach began doing the hokey cokey. But I had no choice. I approached the green, and there they were. Having TikToks, doing swears. My insides were doing somersaults. Then I saw one of them. They were holding my satchel. If it's possible, my entire body grimaced. Every liquid in my body began to fizz. I approached the girl, who I think must have been 12, fully prepared to punch her in the face and grab the bag and run. I clenched my fist, ready to rumble. But just as I was about to strike, she spoke. Oh, hello. This is your bag, isn't it? I found it in the hedge. I've spotted you with it around the village before. Have you? Here you go. Have a nice. I was dumbfounded. But Thank you, I responded. Off she popped, along to her on her merry way. I clutched the bag to my chest, almost hugging, hugging it, and proceeded to make my way to the top of Knob Hill as I didn't think my house was safe anymore, plus had Peter Quince's brace or brains all over the place. Welcome in my moment. Sorry, I can't read everything's uh, going on in chat. We're at the final part, everyone. We're at part 10. We're at part 10. I, uh, X. Sorry, it's X. And in brackets, formerly, formerly Twitter. I reached the top of the hill, and looked down at the once peaceful village, now sticky with blood and other inside bits. The satchel was still being held. I was still holding the satchel cl close to my chest. I took out the book and ran my fingers over the cover lumps, not sure how to explain what those were. My hands shook like an arse at a Beyonce show. What was it that was going to try and destroy me? What was going to bring my life to a catastrophic end? What did I have to fear? I nervously opened the book. 
the pages pages were pages were completely blank not a word not a dot not a stain nothing 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 I took a deep breath. Little did I know it would be my last. Well, there we go. Do we all enjoy our story, everyone? Do we all enjoy our story? Do we enjoy it? I know a lot of people were panicking, but I... They thought there's going to be some sort of shenanigans. But you were scared. You were scared. Cherry lad, welcome on in. Bloody clap. Um, Stinky's arrived. Thank you for the follow. Zomella, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. And I know you're all worried about, you know, shenanigans, but um, it's just not my style. You can all, you can all rest. You can all feel calm. You can all, you know, feel, um, oh, 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 what's that? Who's there? Whoa. Who's there? Oh, it's me. But, it's, but, Barma? Yeah, it's me. Are you hot? I'm a ghost. You give me a haunting? Yeah, I'm haunting you. You're haunting me up a storm. You're a g g g g g ghost? Yeah, I'm spooky and scary. Uh, what? What's it like? It's horrid. It's cold. It's horrid. And I'm transparent slightly. Oh. Ooh. Oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable. How long have you been in my house? Oh, not too long. I knocked, but I don't think you answered. Oh. Ooh. Oh my god. Uh, have, you, have you bumped into Derek Akora? No, I, I met Sam a little bit. Kind of, a, kind of a twat, I'll be honest. Kind of a bit of a twat. Like You'd a, assume they'd be nice. The celeb no. ce yeah, it's the celebrity got to his head, I reckon. Yeah, very, very popular with the, uh, with the, what, the, what, the, what do they call them? Um, a, a woos. You know the woos? You ever met a woo? The woos? Google a woo. The type Google of ghost that's a woo. This better not be some kind of euphemism. No, it's a woo. I can't remember how you spell it, but Sam's popular with the woo. I'm going to take a guess. Woo. Uh, I've just got a picture of Ric Flair. Close. It's like old lady ghosts. <laughs> oh, I see. Very popular. Uh, is our Sam. So Sam is wooing the woos? Mm-hmm. All the time. Never stops. Never stops. It's all woo, woo, woo with Sam. Keep it in your... Oh, you're, you're getting ectoplasm everywhere. Ooh. Sticky. Uh, so what... I mean, what do you do? When you're a ghost, what do you get up to? I mean, it's quite boring. Um, I've just been streaming. That's what I've got my headphones on. I've just been streaming on witch.tv. Oh. Oh. And uh, I like to, you know, move objects around slightly. Like, spin chairs a little bit. Or... or, or. Give 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 cups a gentle shove. Sometimes I put my fingers on glasses and make it move around, but I only do it if other people's fingers are on it, obviously. Oh, and they're slinging hot like orbs at people. Slinging your orbs? Yeah, sling it, slinging thick thick orbs all around. Oh my! People seem to like okay. it. Makes them go. Oh. Uh, do you think you're gonna? Do you think you're gonna go to your own funeral? No, I don't think so. I'll give it a, a bit morbid for me that. No, I think I'll stay. Plus, fucking, I was a mess. So if that's an open casket, I don't want to see that. I was a oh right God. mess. There was a pencil in my eye. I'd be, be a bold, be a bold decision to make it an open casket, considering what happened. Yeah, pretty fucked up. Uh, I'm kind of upset about it. I'll be honest. Not, not thrilled. Not thrilled. Murdered. So, murder, murder. murder. Um. So. You're just gonna 
just go around various streamers' house for the rest of eternity? What's going on? I thought we were friends, and I thought, you know, if anyone would understand being murdered and being a, a, a ghost now, it'd be you. So I thought I'd come here. See how you're doing. What? Check in. Why would I, und- why would I understand that? I don't know. Weird, isn't it? Um, it's Halloween, so it feels like a special day for you to be, uh, you know... Yeah, they keep telling me that. Ghosting. They keep telling me, like, Ghosting around. make the most of it, it's Halloween, you know, but... It's, it's Ghost Christmas, isn't it? It's just another day in hell for me. Not actual hell. hell. No, no, not actual hell, I just mean being dead, kind of rubbish. I didn't go to hell. I didn't get to heaven either. Well, so, we don't know... So, is, do you, I mean, when you become a ghost, do you get, like, instructed in any way? And, like, are you just left to it? I just got a list. Figure out the job as you go on. Yeah, I just got... So you don't know if there's, like, a... What is it? Like, you have a thing that needs to be righted, a wrong that needs to be righted or something before you transcend, all that stuff. Well, I don't know. I've not really given that too much thought. So when you die, uh, you kind of just wake up where you died. So I was just in my room. Um, but there was this list, like, on, like, a little sticky note attached to my arm. And it just said, do's and don'ts. But there was actually nothing written down. Not that I could make out anyway. It seems to be in some kind of different symbolic I think language. you mean... I think you mean do's and don'ts, right? The boos and the don'ts. That doesn't make sense. Do's and the don'ts. Uh, are you enjoying it? No. It's, it's rubbish. It's really rubbish. Nobody takes me seriously as a ghost. They took me seriously what when is... I was alive, though. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. but uh, Maybe... Given that it's Halloween, yeah, uh, there are all sorts of sinister forces at play. Maybe we could, I don't know, see if there's some sort of ritual where we could send you back to your body, bring you back to life. As a treat. Wait, my body. The dead. Or a trick. The dead body. The dead body. Well, I hope that what would happen is it bring you back to life, and you can uh, come back to giving us absolutely premium content what about my eye will it bring my eye back because it's got a pencil in well it. we'll have to wait and see i think uh it might be that it's still there but you can oh. i could i think you could rock an eye patch oh i think i'd look like a cute pirate what do you think i think you'd do i think i'm i'm not even being glib here i genuinely think you could rock an eye patch let's do it bring me back let's give it a sh- <laughs> well i guess i just let's google it yeah google it how to bring back friend. How to bring back associate. All right. Uh, it's taken me to uh, MySpace Tom's LinkedIn page. Well, he'd know. He was my first Anyone's friend. Anyone's going to know. <laughs> first, some may say best. He's up there. Definitely top eight. Top eight. We made the same MySpace uh, joke. <laughs> uh, right, I've got it here. Okay. I've got... I'm going to say a, an incantation. Oh. And hopefully, this will send you into a body. Oh. A body. Your body, hopefully. My body. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm ready. Wasps! Okay. Here we go. I'm ready. Et. Et. Vosferamini. Barber. Et. Vosferamini, Barber, S. Vosferamini, Barber! I feel. I feel a bit different. Uh, I feel a bit different as well. I feel still kind of cute though. Barber? Wasps? Are you inside me? Um, well, I I don't think I'm inside you so much as we're kind of entangled, we're entwined, we've been twained. Oh, what are you doing? Wasps. Don't look down there. Wasps. Uh, what do you feel funny? Welcome to my existence. It's, it's nice. I'm going to say nice. A solid... Six out of ten body. I like this. Can I... Can I stay? Uh, I mean, does that make me a Twitch partner? No. May, no, may, it does not. no. Maybe we need to 
I don't know. Sort this out off stream. Well. Oh, well. Fine. Let's just raid Precious Rogan. Be done with this. I need a shower. We need a shower. Ooh. I don't, I don't know how I feel about this anymore. You will. I don't know if. It, does it count as. Would it count for me as cheating? Well, just, I tell you what, I tell you what, I won't look. How about that? Okay, we'll step I will. firmly. I will oh, look. Have fun with Precious Rogue, everyone! <laughs> bye. bye! Say bye, Barma. Bye, Barma. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs>